Hi everyone, I'm Marisol Nichols. Now you may know me as an actress from film and television. What you may not know is that I have been working in the anti-trafficking movement for over a decade. I've been honored to work alongside law enforcement as an undercover operative, both in the US and abroad, to help put bad guys in jail and help rescue some women and children. I created my foundation for a slavery-free world and this podcast to help prevent you or your loved ones from ever falling prey to these predators. Thank you, and welcome to the Marisol Nichols Podcast. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Marisol Nichols Podcast. My guest today is Chris Jones from Stop the Traffic. Now, Stop the Traffic is truly an incredible UK-based organization that was founded back in 2005, and they use exploitation analytics... They have prevention programs and they use data-driven solutions, which I love. And I'm going to say that again, data-driven solutions to fight against human trafficking. They have incredible partnerships with major international organizations, including Meta, which we had on our podcast a couple episodes ago, TikTok, IBM, Western Union, the Bank of Ireland, and others. So please welcome to the podcast, Chris Jones. Chris, thank you for joining us. No problem. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So I have to say, when I went on your website, I was I was blown away because your organization does so, so many things. Can you start with sort of giving the audience an overview of what Stop the Traffic does? Just even briefly. (laughs) Yeah, sure. It's uh, so, um, you know, I've worked at Stop the Traffic for um, several years now. Um, It is, as you say, um, a really quite a unique uh, charity NGO uh, in the space that we operate. Um, we do an awful lot of things. We're pretty small, um, but we pretty much operate over um, three or four pillars. So the first pillar is around op- uh, running prevention programs. So we effectively yes. have uh, long term partnerships with Meta and TikTok. Um, and they work with us in a number of ways. Uh, but in the prevention space, what we do is we target um, uh, geographic, geographically targeted um, campaigns aimed at vulnerable individuals who are um, uh, at risk potentially of being trafficked because they're making their way through um, dangerous uh, either tra- human trafficking routes or hotspots. Um, and we're able to serve up um, effectively um, spot signs uh, kind of information um, where if an individual feels that they are in danger of being trafficked, they can go through to um, click through the links and we you know, signpost them to um, local NGOs on the ground who are safe um, places to go, you know, where they can get um, you know, the help that they need. Um, but also it's a bit like knowledge is power. Um, so yeah. the more people know about what they might be potentially walking into, um, the more chance they have of being able to you know, prevent themselves from being uh, you know, kind of um, uh, in a position where they're inadvertently being trafficked. So that's the kind of first thing that we do. We ha- we also run um, an app, uh, which is a reporting app called the Stop App, um, which is um, freely downloadable to any um, phone, um, and that is uh, encouraged through the, um, the the programs that we run um, via TikTok and Meta, and that basically allows us to collate information our intelligence around uh, particular instances of, of, of human trafficking that are happening on the ground. And we have an intelligence team behind the scenes who are looking at that information. Um, so that's the sort of the first pillar. Um, the second pillar is around talking to businesses. As you mentioned, that we work with a whole bunch of businesses. So we work with uh, a number of businesses in um, financial services, um, big tech, um, uh, we also work in the hospitality industry and also the retail sector as well, um, as well as agriculture. Um, and we essentially um, are you know, working with them on uh, what is going on within the human trafficking space right now and really sort of trying to guide them uh, as to how they can uh, mitigate the risk of them mm-hmm. uh, having inadvertently having uh, trafficked people or anybody in modern slavery uh, you know, in their system effectively. That's huge. I just want to sort of mention, I want to summarize a little bit because um, what you just said is so important with businesses, which is, you know, how are they supposed to know, especially if they're a yeah. big giant corporation, that there is 
slavery in their supply lines. Like yeah. how? So it's amazing that you guys actually to go the second step and actually help them themselves instead of just going, well, you figure it out. You know, yeah. it's pretty, that's it, pretty commendable. A lot of organizations have incredibly complicated supply chains. Um, you know, yes. a lot of them operate with, say, franchises, for example, and those franchises will then procure goods uh, separately. So it's not held centrally. Um, there's lots of issues around uh, commodities that go to a marketplace and are then bought. Well, where do they come from to get to the marketplace? You know, there's, there, it's it's yeah. hugely complicated. It isn't just oh, evil businesses are just trying to save money and uh, make as much as they can and exploit everyone. It's actually usually not the case. They're actually trying to eradicate it as best they can. But it is really, really challenging and really, really difficult. If you don't mind me jumping in there, you know, I went to um, I was on the border of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And I saw a full, you already know what I'm going to say, full, full camp, a, a slave labor camp, and the conditions in which the families, like they were born into this slave labor for generations, you could see it. And the conditions in which they were living in were appalling. But what was more appalling was this was a giant vegetable grower. And it had a whole, you know, it had the sign and the name of their organization and company, and then I looked up that company, that company you can't see. So it's like, where does that company who uses slave labor for their products then transfer it to another company who has a different name and so on and so on and so on. So I, I just yeah. wanted to sort of mention that to your point. Yeah, no, exactly. It's really difficult. And um, I think we in the intelligence industry, we call it sort of pulling the red thread. You just keep sort of going until you sort of get there. Yeah. And it is really challenging because... You know, a lot of these organizations, are, uh, you know, have um, procurement and audit um, policies and procedures in place that are really robust. Um, but without visiting every single supplier um, and the supplier right. of the supplier. So we call it tier one supplying which suppliers, which is those people who directly supply you. But then that supplier has also procured goods to make whatever it is that you are procuring from them. And so it goes on. So it's almost like a mirror against a mirror. And it can literally go on to sort of tier 20 and beyond around the amount mm. of times that somebody has bought in a good or a service that way down the chain, miles away from the, the actual good that you produce as an organization, there has been exploitation. Um, and then, exactly. well, who's on the hook for that? Is it the big multinational corporation right at the end or or what? And And there's also right. really big challenges around and genuine challenges around, um, you know, honesty. You know, there, there are a lot of organisations that will just make up false, you know, uh, uh, statements and falsify their procurement audits um, just to get, you know, the, the, the business in. And so how do you then go about without having somebody literally visiting every single place, every single factory, almost every single field that the, the goods come from to, to figure out how this is this is happening? So. The way that we do it is we 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 essentially are able to um, come up with a risk score. So, uh, you know, an organization typically will say, hey, well, look, our, uh, you know, we, we have uh, suppliers from these regions. So we would then look at them and go, OK, well, these ones are high risk. Um, so let's start there. Let's start looking at the higher risk ones. And then we can go through and look at, you know, the tier one to 20 um, supply chains and say, OK, well, and you sort of just basically grade them and say, OK, on a scale of one to five, one being good, five being, you know, really high risk. Um, these are the ones you need to to look at. So it goes from being hundreds of supply uh, suppliers to maybe 10 or 20 that, you know, these are the high risk ones. Mm -hmm. You probably start there. Um, so it gives them some something to look at and something to, to aim for. Um, and we kind of really trying to help them find a bit of a needle in a haystack um, mm -hmm. and these are typically people who are, who are genuinely trying to not have modern slavery and human trafficking you know in their supply chains so it is really important that um, we engage with businesses um, but there's also the sort of third pillar um, which is around the money so yes. this is you know this is really important right the primary motivator for a human trafficker is money it's profit that's why they do what they do it's because it is, you know, any estimate from 150 billion to 300 billion. I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, variance in the estimates around. And the reason that there's huge variation is because it's not an audited business. You know, we don't fully know, right. but we know it's a huge, a hugely profitable business. Um, 
and you know that that is is both uh you know obviously distasteful and not something that most people uh uh you know are, are necessarily aware of but these people are incredibly entrepreneurial they're very networked um they're about uh, uh you know uh innovating they're looking at all the new ways in which they can get people across borders or use the tech platforms to their advantage to get people uh you know effectively into some sort of slavery and it starts small and then before you know it you know you're in a situation where you potentially have your passport taken from you you don't control your accounts anymore and somebody is you know effectively renting you out either for work or commercial sexual exploitation or whatever it might be and they're making the money from you um and you don't have any rights because they've trafficked you into the country so you're now a criminal in the country that you're now in. So it's really, really challenging you know, environment. But the good thing about tracing the money uh, is that they leave um, a footprint. They leave a pattern. Right. Um, they're moving their money through legitimate channels. They're moving them across legitimate accounts. So the financial services you know, industry is really key for us finding and tracking down those individuals. That's amazing. And can you, can you, because I'm going to go back to the first pillar and spend some time there, but since we're talking about the financial line and the chain of that, um, can you sort of explain using, because you work directly with banks, Mm -hmm. how is it that these criminals are not only, obviously they're able to move it through legitimate channels because they have, that's how money moves, but how is it that, um, sort of your relationship with the banks and other financial institutions sort of points a finger at, hey, look at this. This is criminal activity. Can you just walk us through how your organization works with that? Yeah, so we've developed a suite of reports effectively called Exploitation Analytics. Um, and effectively, at a, at a sort of macro level, um, we have reports, sort of high-level strategic reports called Key Judgment Reports. Um, so we, we basically produce a couple of those a month um, and you know, businesses and organisations subscribe to to receive these these reports from us. Um, and what those key judgment reports do is they highlight key hotspots, routes, types of trafficking that is going on, uh, or even instances that we've been able to uncover. Um, so at, at a very high level, describing you know, in with, with you know when when a Typically, when a sort of war or a you know um, natural disaster happens, you know when governments are slow to react, there's a lot of um, opportunity then for the traffickers to go in and the organised crime gangs to go. Okay, great. There's going to be loads of people who are displaced, and we know how to move them, and we can make money out of this effectively, um, which is quite a sickening thought. But that's that's the way they operate. Um, yes. And so being able to communicate that to uh, you know, major organisations means that they are able to be aware of, OK, this is what is happening at a macro level uh, in the world of human trafficking at the moment. Um, so one of the things that we were able to recover um, or uncover recently is um, a pig butchering scam. I don't know whether you're aware of what that might be. Not at all. Did you just say pig? Did you just say, I just want to make sure, pig butchering scam. You yeah, said, so okay. it, Continue. That's right. So it, 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 it's it's slang, obviously. So it's um, organised yeah. crime gangs running effectively romance scams. Um, so we were able to uncover a uh, a network of these uh, individuals who were working out of a warehouse in Myanmar in Southeast Asia. Uh, and they were scamming prim- primarily UK and US citizens. Um, so we've taken this to um, uh, to the you know, US authorities. What were they doing? Effectively, um, they would be advertising. Uh, so, so what the organised crime gangs were incredibly clever, uh, and they were investing an awful lot in what they were doing. So, they were um, the scam basically started off with them recruiting um, perfectly smart, legitimate individuals. They were taking them from the, the three that got in touch with us were from you know Ethiopia and Uganda, so Central and Northern uh, Africa. They were trafficked via Dubai. They were interviewed um, as anybody normally would for a job. Um, right. It was it was advertised on a major tech platform. Um, they answered the job, the false job ad effectively. 
they were interviewed in Dubai. They were told, hey, look, we've got this, you're going to be working with this great company. You've got, you know, a couple of thousand dollars a, a month salary. Um, you're going to have health care, all this great stuff. We're going to fly you out. It's going to be brilliant. But they would they would do legitimate things like test them for their competency using a computer, um, their ability to speak English. So they were being really specific on who they wanted and, and what they wanted. They'd then fly them into Thailand. They'd stay in a hotel. Um, they'd then move them across the border into Laos. And then they'd take them to the river uh, where there was a boat waiting. Uh, and this is the point at which the, the couple, who, the two or three that we were talking to, um, kind of realised that uh, the situation they were in because they were basically forced into the boat and told, if you don't get in the boat, we're going to shoot you and throw you in the river. So that's when they kind of knew, OK, the game's up. But they had given them money. They'd taken them to a hotel. They spent three or four nights being able to come and go as they please. So there was nothing up until the point where they got to the river that they knew something was up. They were just like, this is great. You know, I've got this job and I'm going to Southeast Asia. And this is going to be amazing. And then they were taken over the border uh, and, you know, they, to Myanmar, which is a law, effectively a lawless state. So, they, you know, the crime gangs aren't stupid, right? They know where to set up, where they're going to get away with this and where they can effectively bribe officials to look the other way. Um, so we got a, and it started off with an email. So we got an email from this uh, Ugandan uh, individual uh, who, we, who we call Abdul, not his real name. Uh, and he effectively told us, look, I'm being kept here. I'm being forced to make calls. I'm being forced to scam individuals. And it was a kind of romance scam. So if you've ever had a text message or a WhatsApp that says, hey, I'm a 42 year old, whatever, looking for some friendship. Some people respond to that. And once you respond, you know, you're then in hooked in. So it's um, they, they hook you in and then they get you to transfer some money and then it's a little bit more money and then it's cryptocurrency and investments and they're using real models to actually be on a phone call so that you see somebody who is really attractive and um, that you're right. going to effectively meet eventually and you're, you're kind of from your side you're falling for it um, and of course it's all a scam and it's going straight into the organized crime gangs and when they get you that's when they've slaughtered a pig I see. And that's why why it's called pig butchery, because they that's how they uh that's how they set it up. Um so we we we'd followed this um case from Cambodia up and in, in through to Myanmar. We're seeing some cases coming in into Mexico now as well, because it's profitable. But the, the lengths that these criminal gangs go to to recruit these individuals is quite staggering because they will buy air tickets they will interview properly they will give you v get you buy get your visa sorted they'll give you cash in hand you know they give you a hotel room for a few nights and you're just thinking this is great dream job why would you exactly why would you even suspect anything you know yeah. uh, we've talked about this before on the podcast that they'll put up websites they'll have websites they'll have a business card it looks completely legit i, I actually haven't heard that they will give you cash money and have you, you know, walk around freely. I haven't heard that part of it, but it is astonishing, as you mentioned, the lengths that these criminal organizations will go to. It's and, and people don't realize that. And, and I think, you know, I've lost count of the amount of times and, the, you know, the, the, the individuals we talk to or the companies we talk to or whoever it is that say, you know, isn't it wasn't modern slavery. Wasn't that something that we got rid of in the 1800s? Wasn't that when kind of, right. you know, we stopped taking people across the, you know, from one continent to another and forcing people to work, didn't we? And you're like, no, it's still going on. I, but it's, they've got right. much more, much more technical and much more proficient, entrepreneurial, <laughs> innovative, and they're using the technology we use to for for illegitimate gain, effectively. And yep. all they need is a mobile phone to do it. That's it. Exactly. It's, um, it's insane. Yeah. I'm gonna, um, if you don't mind, I want to jump back to your very, very first pillar that you were talking about, about prevention. Um, can you, you mentioned earlier that you do these geo targeted ads. So what that means to my audience, because I didn't even know what that meant just to be blunt, <laughs> you have a way better vocabulary than I do. Explain to the audience what your geo, how, what does that even mean? Geo targeted ads and how does it work in reaching people that are in vulnerable situations, please. 
Yeah, sure. So a, a great yeah. example, a couple of examples that we recently ran. Obviously, we had the Ukraine war um, start up. So you then had a lot of people that were on the move very quickly, right? Um, and they were coming basically through Poland. Um, the route typically was through the Pol through the Ukraine Polish border, through Poland, and then out into Europe, into you know various countries. So you um, mean that the traffickers showed up in Ukraine and were tar and were trafficking people through that route into Europe? Okay, they, exactly. Yeah. So as soon as basically as soon as there is any. Um, level of uncertainty, any political instability, any war, any natural disaster. So there was the, the earthquake in Turkey as well. That was another right. uh, instance where we were able to launch something really quick and say, hey, if these things are happening to you, this is, you know, this is what you, where you could end up. So effectively, what the uh, Meta and TikTok allow us to do is um, target specific geographic regions, specific profiles of individuals. So typically women and children you know of a certain age which is why TikTok's really useful because they're they allow a younger profile um so they've been absolutely brilliant as as, as have meta uh, in supporting this um and we're able to reach a huge number of in, of people who are literally looking at their their social media feeds right and then this comes across and they think oh actually hang on i am just in a car with somebody who i didn't know who i think is helping me hang on a minute and then right. all these things happening. OK, then you need to speak to these people. Um, and so we were so able to connect to... them with like the proper authorities and where to go yeah. and how to get out of the situation that they may be finding themselves in or to avoid it in the first place. Exactly right. So hopefully they they read it and they are now more aware. Unfortunately, some just don't have a choice. They're like, well, it's either stay here and be bombed or get in the car with this guy. You know, it's really, you know, terrible. I mean, I think I was thinking about this as a, before I came on to the to the podcast as well. And um, I remember uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell made this brilliant point about um, if he had a magic wand, he would literally what he his wish would be. He would swap rich people and poor people for two weeks, just two weeks. And he his 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 theory was that poor people would not be surprised at all at the rich people's lives because they understand that and they see it on the TV. Mm. We, however, would be absolutely shocked at the conditions that prop really poor people live in and what they have to go through. Um, and, and if we could get that wish, then we'd have possibly more understanding as to what you know the, the challenges are and what makes people move. Because there was huge sympathy, obviously, with the, you know, the Ukrainian movement of people because of what had happened. That is very rarely the case. And obviously, you know, uh, government uh, rhetoric typically is uh, to the negative for this sort of thing. Um, they often, you know, immigrants will get blamed for most things unfairly, um, but that's, that's the way it goes. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's typically because I think people just cannot possibly imagine the desperate situation that these individuals find. Not all of them, I get you, that, that's true, but you know, uh, that, that, that no, but them... you really, it, it's almost unthinkable, you know, these images that we're seeing currently of the the Israel-Palestine whole situation there. And mm. it's it's truly unimaginable that, that to most of, you know, Western society that, you know, we're sitting in our homes, we're sitting in our condos, we're going to work, that all of a sudden there could be bombs yeah. and war, yeah. such as yeah. Ukraine, immediately. And you're displaced and you have to go and you have nowhere to go and it's just get away from the explosions. Just get away from the explosions. And and as you mentioned, these bad actors show up and they put up signs and they go, we'll take you to safety. We'll help you here. We have an organization. Give us your orphans. If you have any displaced kids, give them to us. You know, we've talked about this uh, in other episodes. And how were, how was anyone supposed to know? They're already in a in shock for lack of a better word, in complete trauma, that it's any yeah. solution will do except for what they're under. So the fact that your organization is reaching them through social media and the internet and technology and going, look out for this, look out for that, uh, go here, these people are legitimate, these people are not. We, we need that on such a planetary-wide uh need Scale. that Scale. i i can't exactly i can't thank yeah. you and your organization enough for that truly we, we play a small part in this we 
we are looking obviously for scale in what we do. Um, where where I think we're really quite different is obviously we have a, a, a unique approach. As most organisations will say, they've got a unique approach. But what really so the CEO and founder Ruth Dernley, who's um, started this back in as you say two thousand and five, um, she when 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 I started talking to her about this in my particular role and the organisation, what really sort of hooked me in was she said, look, we operate upstream. What we we're not a rescue organization. Rescue organizations are great and they do a fantastic job. But at some point you've got to go up the river and find out why the bodies are fallen in rather than just pulling them out and, and rescuing 100%. them. And so that's what we're really trying to do is go, okay, what is happening on the ground? Um, how can we understand that from a, a victim or sort of vulnerable person perspective and warn them? Uh, but also, what is the trafficker doing? What's their business right. model? Because it is a business model. Uh, and once you figure that out, you're like, oh, OK, so they're running a business um, and, mm. you know, they're, they're that and they're, and they're interested in profit. Um, OK, well, how do we deal with that? Well, you know, one of the ways that we do that, we have a, a, a data warehouse that we built with IBM uh, two or three years ago, which the, the data feeds that we get from social media, from the Stop app, um, uh, and from other NGOs, they can share the data in and store it. So we have this kind of survivor um, narrative information um, that we can draw on. Can you explain that a little bit? Sort of, can you explain, sorry to cut you off, but I, I really want to understand this part about how you're gathering data about all of this. Can you Can you elaborate a little bit more about how that sort of how you're what you're learning and how you're getting the data and learning from it and then i understand how you're acting after probably the, the most straightforward way of explaining it is to try and understand what's going on on the ground so um we obviously through the the campaigns that we can run we can we're talking directly to people who are vulnerable and they're feeding back to us either through the stop app or through comments that they make um through the social media feed you know mm. some of them we're able to contact and and and, and capture their story um, but we also have a network of about two to three hundred NGOs globally that will then f will also feed in. So they're on the ground working with you know the individuals who are being trafficked. Often they don't have much more than a laptop, if that, to be able to store any of this. So we we for free say, look, you just store the information. Uh, we'll give you a live feed. You can just you know send us what you have, and we then collate it. Um, and we're able to store that. And that gives us a really rich picture, um, you know, of, of from the sort of first perspective of from people who have been either trafficked or attempted to be trafficked, what's going on and what's going on on the ground. So it gives you a rich picture of um, some of the hotspots and routes and where these things are popping up uh, and what's wow. happening. So it's a, I mean, that's it, invaluable data. That's phenomenal. It's in real time. It's It's right there. Because the one thing I've noticed, and I'm not sure if 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 you've run into this, is that law. You know, everyone's like, well, "Why isn't law enforcement? Well, how come there's no laws? Or what about blah blah blah?" And I'm like, "They're just catching up to the problem. The problem is always evolving and changing so rapidly that by the time it gets, you know, to someone who can actually, by then the game has moved on to a different game. Yeah. So what your organization is doing and gathering that that data is invaluable. Yeah, truly. it really is, and, and absolutely. And we do work with law enforcement. Um, Interpol have been brilliant. Um, they've been really useful. They helped uh, enormously with that Myanmar case, the pig butchering case. Um, and they were able to go in and with boots on the ground eventually. Mm. I don't know exactly what happened. They're you know ongoing cases and and, and all of that. Sure. Um, but you know you know the, a lot of the time law enforcement have their hands tied by the type of government that are around them uh, and they're reacting. Uh, to, to, to what they're seeing. Um, there is, you know, obviously, you know, you guys have FBI, we have the National Crime Agency here. We we do link in um, and, and share what we know. Um, and they've been really useful. Um, kind of difficult to get feedback on exactly what happens and where it goes. Yeah. Quite often we, we, so with financial services, uh, they're often already red flagged an account and we can say hey we think this person may be a trafficker and they say oh great because we had red flagged that account but we didn't know why mm -hmm. they then take it further ultimately they can involve you know that can involve law enforcement um law enforcement might look at it and say hey this is part of an even bigger network 
right. um, that we're so going after, goes... right? So, so there's layers upon layers. In it's a bit like the supply chain analogy. It's the same sort sure. of thing. It's <laughs> different tiers uh, as you, as you mm -hmm. kind of go through. One of the major challenges we've actually had is mm. uh, when you're trying to prove your effectiveness because um, how do you prove something didn't happen because of the information you gave someone? Yes. <laughs> is our biggest I, I, challenge. I, I understand <laughs> that. I completely, because it's prevention yeah. and it's the undercut. So, you know, as you mentioned, or as your founder mentioned, it's one thing to pull the bodies out of the river. It's another thing to go, hey, maybe we could prevent the bodies from being dumped in the river. And yeah. how do you statisize that? So yeah. I, I actually do understand that, you know, the point of my podcast is I, I have a very unique audience just from being on Riverdale. And so I have a certain age group and parents who watched Riverdale with their kids. So that's who I'm trying to reach to educate directly. It's an undercut so that nothing like these things ever happen because they're educated. They have knowledge. And, but it's how, how do you, how do you statisize that? So I, I, I understand that. But yeah. it's it's huge. I mean, the, even the stories that you, you have, Myanmar and Syria and the earthquakes and and other amazing things. I mean, listen, this could be a two hour episode. And I really hope you come back again, because there's so much to cover of what your organization is doing. And it's so beyond admirable, because it's before the fact. It's before anything happens, or at least that's the target. And sometimes, obviously, it's also as it's happening. But it's just it's invaluable information, truly. The more we can talk about it and the more we can share um, with organizations such as yourselves, but also, you know, major global organizations it, and, and the individuals who may be in, at risk of this kind of yes. business, uh, the, you know, it is literally knowledge is power. And the more that people know about it, the more we can do to prevent it. It's, it's almost as simple as that. Um, and the more we understand about how these business these businesses work, which is what these traffickers are, yep. then you're then you're then you're getting into more of the detail on, okay, so there's a pattern. How do we you know, develop typologies for financial services to, to run across their systems? Can we give them instances? Can we give them individual uh, PII data, like a cell phone or something, or a email address to say, these people we suspect, are they in your system? And that cuts across um, any organization, I guess, that holds an account. So social media, tech platforms, typically the the, the, the the phone number, the cell number is the unique identifier. And if you can get that, you can bring down a whole network. And our kind of, uh, if I was to, as a sort of marketing and communications person, part of me, I've been trying for two, three years now to try and distill down into one word what it is that we try and do at Stop the Traffic. And it is disrupt or disruption. And that's what we're trying to do. So the more we can disrupt these people, these individuals, the harder it makes it for them. Um, so if we can stack up financial services, social media, policy, et cetera, and take them down, uh, f mobile phone technology, et cetera, you're just making it harder for them. You block them out for a while. Uh, yes, sure, they're going to get another mobile phone, but it takes them a little while to build it back up again. Just makes it, it disrupts them, you know, and exactly. maybe and for that 20,000 people get through that wouldn't have got through, you know, without their influence. Exactly. Exactly. And for that individual, you know, I always talk about, I've, you know, I've, I've done, I've been on certain operations and sort of thing. And it's, it is playing whack-a-mole because another one will pop up. But for those individuals that got out of that situation, escaped that situation, or their trafficker got disrupted and they never ended up being taken, as you put it, for them, it's, they've gotten their life. You've yeah. saved their life. So it doesn't, it, it's always always, always, always worth it. And, you know, I don't know about you, but the one thing that I have found because the problem gets so overwhelming because it's so not only dark, but global and it's so broad and it's everywhere is that is the amount of NGOs, the amount of law enforcement, the amount of different organizations that are trying to help, to stop, to prevent, to disrupt, to rescue, to rehabilitate, to educate. It's, you know, that's what gives me the most hope is how many people are willing to to help and do something about it. And it's it actually brings me to my next thing that I really want to talk about because I'm going to put it on the on our podcast. So if you're, my audience is watching this on YouTube, they can see it is the Stop app. 
which your organization has created, which is phenomenal, which puts power into the hands of any individual who downloads that app right onto their phone. Can you talk about the Stop app? And obviously we'll put a link to it and everything, but I, want, I would like to hear it from you. It literally is um, a simple uh, uh, feature that allows individuals to um, literally upload and report an instance. Um, so quite often what we what we hear from um, individuals who use the app is that they either didn't have somewhere to raise a, a concern or an issue, or it wasn't quite enough to go to the police with or border force or whatever. It was just a feeling they got that there was an instance, something was happening over here. But obviously, something's wrong, something's off. Yeah, I, I saw this guy and he's got two or three others and they look a bit disheveled and they go into the cash point and they're getting money out and... He's take, he looks like he's taking the money. They come every Friday. I don't know. Uh, where do I go? And that's mm. just, you know, in some retail stores, you know, like supermarkets, etc. You know, you get the security guard standing there who sees this. And they go, well, where, where right. do I report this? OK, right. well, here's an app. Report it. Because we then collate it and look in the background and go, we're getting a few of these. Uh, you know, this is what you know. This is what we're seeing, and we're able to then write reports on it. You know, whether that's a key judgment to say these things are happening, or whether it's something we just go to law enforcement and say, hey, this is what's happening in in this area, and we're seeing a, n a number of instances. I don't know whether you in the states have county lines issues where, mm -hmm. yeah, you have jurisdiction. You know, we do, yeah, one hundred percent. Yes, yeah. So, so that is also an issue. We have a lot of. Um, uh, of youngsters who are also um, uh, uh, kind of led into, you know, gangs and, and drugs. And it, it is a, a form of trafficking because they are then taking, you know, they're seen as, you know, less risky because the police don't are not looking for them. They're the ones who are taking drugs and illicit whatever um, across county lines. So they're moving, you know, the money. So these... These individuals are constantly looking at ways of bucking the system, of, of getting around the laws, etc. Mm -hmm. And and people will see this and think, oh, it's not quite enough to dial 911 or 999 in the UK and get the police turning up because I don't know what it is. But the Stop app allows anybody to, it's very simple form, just fill it out and submit it. And it comes to us, it gets stored, it gets looked at. Uh, some of the cases we, we get are proper safeguarding cases where we have to step in and, and escalate, you know, wherever they are to local law enforcement in whether it's Europe or Africa or wherever the reporters come in or one of our um, local NGO partners. Uh, it's in multiple languages. I think it's in over 20 languages. Um, so, you know, anybody, we, we typically update the languages based on the routes and hotspots um, that we uh, use it across. Um, and we've got, you know, individuals in the organization who can speak, you know, multiple languages. Uh, we've got those kind of millennials who, who are good at everything. Uh, and we <laughs> speak multiple languages and, uh, uh, and that makes it, um, you know, easy for us to then pick out you know, some trends of, of, you know, what we think is might be going on. And is the Stop app, does it also, like, does it also work in the United States? So it's the United States, UK, is that correct? And Europe it's, too? Or everywhere? Yeah, it, it, it can work everywhere. Um, so it's downloadable anywhere from any app store. Um, Beautiful. And, you know, and, and effectively we just put it into, I think it's, you know, 20 odd languages um, so that anybody who's using it globally um can can look at it i think we've got a hundred odd thousand downloads so it's it's not huge huge on the scale on the scale of say your twitter followers uh for example but uh <laughs> um but well, <laughs> it, for, for a small ngo like us uh you know we've, we've got some pretty decent reach no we find that actually what happens is quite a lot of people will download it as they're moving through you know and they're maybe in a situation and then once they get through it they they kind of delete it after that oh well, I, I think it's a phenomenal tool, and hopefully this podcast will help get other people to download it. We're also going to put it on our website so that people have that and know where to go. But it puts the hand, it puts the power in the hands of anyone. And just so yeah. my audience knows, I believe you can report anything anonymously. You don't have to say, this is my name and this is my address, and I saw these bad guys who live across the street. You can do this anonymously. And... You know, I, I have found, I don't know if you found this as well, but when you educate people for the first time to what modern day slavery or human trafficking looks like, all of a sudden they see it everywhere. And I know this because they all text me. 
<laughs> like, I saw this thing. What do I do? And I'm like, I have no idea. I'd call, you know, call the police or whatever until I came across your organization and the Stop app. And now I can say, report it. Also, we record what gets reported into the, um, the data warehouse as well so that we can look at it kind of from a geographical perspective and see what trends there might be. So it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing. So actually, if somebody sees something and they then report it, if 15, 20 other people are doing the same, um, then, you know, we, we can obviously see that there's a trend there and then we can start really looking at it. And if it is something that's happening in a particular state in the US, like say it's right. agriculture or whatever, then we can, you know, delve more deeply into it or report it to local authorities on your behalf because what you might have seen isn't enough to prompt an investigation but what 20 people saw is <laughs> right exactly and it adds up and it and it and like i said people do see things and they want to report it and they want to tell somebody and they don't know where to go and that's where the yeah. stop app comes in and it's just it's a brilliant brilliant tool we'll make sure to put it up everywhere and to everyone who's listening to the podcast you know, he did say you can download it anywhere where you can download apps and add it to your phone. So it's a vital, vital tool to not only use for yourself, but to tell others to download as well. Yeah. So, um, so thank you for creating that app. Um, Chris, this has been amazing. I don't want to cut it short, but I do want to see if there was anything else that you felt that we didn't touch on. We're going to have you back. I hope you know that you're not getting away with just one episode. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, is there anything else that you wanted to mention to the audience that is listening? You know, just thank you so much for having uh, me on board. I think, you know, you, I've, I've seen what you guys do and what you do as well. Um, and so it's, it's really great um, to speak to a kindred spirit. I think there are, there are a couple of other individuals within the organization who I put forward as well like our CEO Ruth would be great to have on the podcast as uh, well yes. as our director of intelligence uh, Neil Giles who used to be mm -hmm. director of the National Crime Agency just really interesting people um, to take the kind of story that. a couple of steps forward um, just really great people and you know the, really the message to uh, you know anybody who's out there is to just never give up hope and always keep on reporting it and trying because the knowledge is power the more we're aware of you know the, the issues and the challenges the more we can the more we can do about it and prevent it disrupt it that's wonderful and to the people and to add on to that there are people listening so when you report it and you tell someone there are people listening and right now that is stop the traffic so thank you for coming on thank you chris it was so wonderful to meet you and thank you to my audience to listening or listening to another episode of the Marisol Nichols podcast. Thank you. Please join us in this fight. Go to slaveryfreeworld.org and donate. Every amount helps. I truly appreciate your support. Thank you for listening to the Marisol Nichols podcast and please do not forget to click like and subscribe and a big shout out to WD Hahn for our theme song, Something's Gotta Change. See you next time.